How's everyone doing this morning? As I had said earlier, there's, God is doing something prophetically in the midst of us today. And you'll see between the worship, Sister Nancy's exhortation, and the word coming forth today, that there is healing available today in this house. Amen. Amen. Let's just open up with a word of prayer. And let's, uh, let's get into the word. Father, I thank you today for each and every individual gathered here today. And Lord, as we gather around your word and see what you're about to do, Lord, let us have hearts that are receptive and open. I come against all forces of the enemy, every lying and condemning spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen. I believe the blood over each and every person here. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. And so, Lord, we gather around here to be with you today, to hear from you, to receive from you, and to walk in the freedom that you give us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 On Wednesday evening, Pastor Frank taught us on spiritual warfare. If you weren't here, I really would recommend and encourage you to listen to, whether it's... Uh, 8-track or CD or reel-to-reel -reel or, or online, however you do it, listen to this message because it's going to curtail with what is going on this morning. But he, he said to be ready. We need to be ready to engage the enemy and not be prepared or familiar against the enemy's schemes. We need to be prepared. One scheme that Pastor Frank touched on was the enemy using fear to intimidate us and to render us ineffective. Today I would like to touch on another scheme of the wicked one. The scheme of Satan is just as old as time itself. Matter of fact, the origins is introduced in the Garden of Eden. Now I'm going to open up to Genesis chapter 3, but we're going to really be out of Psalm 25, so if you want to get ahead of me and turn to Psalm 25, we'll be there momentarily. I'm just going to read just a few verses out of Genesis chapter 3. Verses 1 through 9. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman... Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? We're seeing something happen here as the enemy is introduced in the garden. Now I want to show you that one of the first emotions that man felt from the fall, and we see in verse 7, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made covering for themselves. One of the first emotions from the fall to enter into man that man had never experienced before was shame. 
They related to each other on a continual basis. Never did they see themselves as naked. Never were they ashamed to be in each other's company, nor in the company of God. But immediately after the fall, when their eyes were opened, they saw each other's nakedness, and they became ashamed. And they hid from each other, and they sewed fig leaves together to cover what they thought was shame. Shame is one of the first feelings to come upon Adam and Eve in the garden immediately after the fall. Shame caused them to cover their nakedness. Shame caused them to hide from God. Shame is a debilitating weapon used by Satan to separate us from God and from others. For some of us, shame was used in our formative years as a means of control and manipulation. If we didn't do right or we displeased those that had authority over us, we were shamed. And so shame became something of a curse in our lives. And because it became a curse in our lives, we acted out of that curse and did things that were shameful to fulfill self-fulfilling prophecy. And we began to live a life of shame. And today, I want to let you know that God wants to break the curse of shame over our lives. First of all, shame is not from God. Though he is familiar with it through his son Jesus, after he defeated it on the cross. It says, it says in Hebrews 12.1 that, that, that though he see, seeing the cross, he despised the shame. And so Jesus, walking as man did, fully God, fully man, is familiar with all of our emotional makeup. Shame being one of them. And the only victory over shame is through Jesus Christ. There is no shame in God. God does not shame his children into obedience. God does not use shame. The words of God never come across to us when we fall and when we sin and when, we, when we're disobedient. God's words are never shame on you. There is no shame in God. So because there is no shame in God, he doesn't use shame as a tool against us. The enemy does. See, in God, there's love. In God, there's grace. In God, there's mercy. In God, there's forgiveness. In God, there's kindness. In God, there's patience. There is no shame in God, for he is the epitome of of all of these attributes, plus more. It is these characteristics of God that is the antidote against the poison of shame's effect in our lives. If shame is a tool the enemy uses to drive a wedge between God and our relationship to him, then we can deal with it and break the hold of shame over our lives. As we get into the word today, if you're with, with me, please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 25. When I was asking the Lord, what is it that I wanted to say, even Jill says to me, what are you speaking on? And I had said to her, speaking on the, you know, breaking the power of shame. And she was like, oh, great. When the Lord gave it to me, one, I knew it was going to be a heavy word, two, it just and sometimes when the Lord gives you something, sometimes it stings. See, but when God stings, he's stinging for a purpose of healing. It's like going to a doctor's and getting a needle with the medicine that we need to be free and to be well. And so where you may feel a sting, understand that it's a sting for a purpose of setting you free today. There are four ways that shame has conquered in our lives, and we're going to look at it today. Let's read together Psalm 25. I'm reading out of the NIV um, only because it 
was the way it was worded it just seemed right to me. I have other Bibles in, that I that I use from time to time, but today just the NIV. So um, bear with me if you're if you're looking at a different translation. But here we go. Let's get ready. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how fiercely my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope is in you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, from all their troubles. <coughs> now David wrote this psalm in the midst of his own turmoil. Something was going on in the life of David and shame took hold of him. And David took this shame and he brought it to the Lord to find his freedom. Now there are four ways that shame is conquered in our lives and I want to give you those four. The first way that shame can be conquered in our lives is we have to find hope in God alone. Hope destroys shame. Shame destroys hope. David comes to him. David comes to the Lord. And he says, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over you. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. If you want to rid the, the power of shame in your life, you have to find your hope in God, not in the situation. Amen. Well, maybe someday it'll change. Amen. I won't do that again. In time, things will get better. Maybe they won't. Maybe this is my lot in life. I chose this path. I grabbed this thing. Now it has a hold of me. I'm useless. I'm worthless. I'm unlovable. That's the voice of shame over our lives. I'll never change. What's the use? God can in others, but not in me. If they only knew the real me, no one would love me. See, shame causes you to look inward at your sin and at your struggle. But hope causes you to look upward 
It causes you to lift up your soul no matter how heavy it may be in that moment. See, the moment I enter into the presence of God, hope is available for me at that very moment. No matter the struggle, no matter the sin, no matter my emotional makeup at the moment, hope is available, available for me at that very moment that I enter the presence of God. Why? Because God is a God of hope. God is a God of all hope. God is a God of courage, of strength, of wisdom, of grace, of mercy. So hope causes me to look upward. It causes me to lift up my soul. Hope causes me to ask for victory when there is none. As we see in the Psalm of David here, he says, Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. David is calling out for victory in the midst of not having victory. And times when we go into, into the presence of God, we're looking for the same thing. We're looking for victory over our circumstances. We're looking for the victory over our struggles. We're looking for victory over the, over the shame and the guilt that, that the, the enemy heaps upon us. And it's in that moment that God offers us hope. And it's in that moment that we cry out for victory. Victory may not come in a moment, but as you continue to seek with victory, victory is something that you can attain to because God is, all, God is a God of victory. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. He took the this, this keys of sickness, hell, death, and the grave. Amen. He is our champion. He is our victor. And because he won the battle, we can win the battle through him. Amen. Amen. Hope erases shame. It teaches me to walk a path I may, have, I may not know or I may have forgotten. See, each of us in life, God created a path. Your path is different than my path. I cannot walk your path, and you cannot walk my path. But the path that God created us to walk is a unique path, and there are going to be people on that path that only you can touch. It's the path of God. There are times when I wait for the bus with Isabella in the morning, and I pray for her. And one of the things that I pray is that God would give her the eyes to see the path that he created her for. That he would give her eyes to see, a heart to respond, and feet to walk in the path that God created for her. And God has done the same thing for us. We all have a path. And so, when I find hope in God, it teaches me to walk the path that I know or may have forgotten. It renews our vision in who God is, that he is the God of all hope. See, one of the things that happened in the life of Adam and Eve, and that happens with us at times, is sometimes we like to get to the edge. Right? And wrong. And we like to get so close to wrong that it does the same thing that it did to Adam and Eve, it does to us. Mm -hmm. It entices us. Mm -hmm. And because it entices us, and because we're at the edge, and that's where Adam and Eve went. They, there was all of these trees, and instead they went to take a visit to the peach tree. <laughs> Listen, when we get up to heaven, we can argue over it. <laughs> but in full gospel center, I believe it was a peach tree, because you can taste a peach before you even eat a peach. Have you ever put a peach in your hand and immediately your tongue is already tasting the peach and you haven't even bitten it? <laughs> to me, an apple is boring. You can't tempt me with an apple, but you can't tempt me with a peach. <laughs> but I believe that what happened is, is they went and got too close to the edge. And because they, got too, they, they didn't walk their path, they got to the edge, they met Satan. Because Satan always <laughs> lives on the edge. And so they went to the edge, and he enticed them, and, he, and when they partook of it, and he believed their lie, and the woman ate, and because the man didn't take his rightful place between the enemy and the woman, and he partook too, they both fell, and immediately they were put to shame. And that's what happens to us. 
when we get to the edge and we play with sin and it entices us and we enter in, immediately the enemy puts shame on our lives. And what happens is it, just as it did to Adam and Eve, it does to us, it drives us from the presence of God. It, it causes us to hide. It causes us to hide from God and it causes us to hide from one another. And so shame has its destructive course when, it, when, it, when, we, in, when we get enticed this is what happens. Well, what we have here is we, have, we find hope in God alone. See, what happens is when I get into the presence of God, it renews my vision of who God is, and He is the God of all hope. Shame's grip is loosened the moment I encounter God. Amen. Amen. Number two, God's love is the antithesis to shame. Verses 6 through 10. He says, remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his ways. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. So what we see here in number two is God's love is the antithesis to shame. See, God finds worth in you. You have great worth in God. If there was no worth in you, he wouldn't have sent his son Jesus to die for you. Because he made you and knit you in your mother's womb. And because he gave a piece of him he put in you. And because he created a path for you. You have great value and worth in the eyes of God. And because you have great value and worth in the enemy sees that great value and worth. What he looks to do is, is, is come against you and bring shame on you. And draw you away from the purpose and plan of God. But God finds great worth in you. Shame pronounces you as unworthy. But God pronounces you as worthy. Amen. Worthy of his love. Worthy of his grace. Worthy of his mercy. Worthy of his power. Worthy of his presence. Through the blood of Jesus, God finds great worth in you. Shame would pronounce you as unworthy. But that is a lie. And that is not what God says. I want to talk to you a moment about this great love of God. And I want to use a... Ernest Hapman wrote this piece, and uh, it, says, it says this. It says, you can see them alongside shuffleboard courts in Florida or on the porches of the old folks' home up north. An old man with snow-white hair, a little hard of hearing, reading the newspaper through a magnifying glass. I guess I'm old now. <laughs> I was reading with a magnifying glass yesterday, just looking up scripture. <laughs> An old woman in a shapeless dress, her knuckles gnarled by arthritis, wearing sandals to ease her aching arches. They are holding hands, and in a little while, they will totter off to take a nap. Who says old age isn't, isn't good? I felt God in that nap right there. <laughs> After nap, she will cook supper. Not a very good supper, and they will watch television, each knowing exactly what the other is thinking until it is time for bed. They may even have a good soul-stirring argument just to prove that they still really care. And though the night, and through the night, they will snore unabashedly, each resting content because the other is there. They are in love. They have always been in love. Although sometimes they would have denied it. And because they have been in love, they have survived everything that life could throw at them, even their own failures. It's a beautiful picture of marriage. It's a beautiful picture of husband and wife. It's a beautiful picture of a relationship. It's not perfect. 
You know, uh, I sometimes when I see Facebook and uh, even in my own pictures, you think that I live this perfect life. That there are actually angels living in my house. <laughs> who cook our meals, who make our beds, who carry us up to bed at night. And we don't need air conditioning because their wings just cool us through the air. <laughs> Contrary. Not what happens. I have an angel who cooks our meal. Appreciate her. Oh, I know. I was, I was going for effect. I was. <laughs> But here's, here's what the thing is that it's funny, you know, everybody, all of us, we put, we put on, put on our, our pictures that we find that, that, that create this life, this narrative that everything is perfect when everything really is not. In any one of our lives, we're imperfect people. Imperfect people living together in our imperfections. And yet, the picture of the grace of God, because we have to absorb each and every one of our, each other's failures and show grace, show mercy, show love, show patience. And if we can do it for one another, how much more does God do that for us? Show us grace. How much more does God pursue us when we hide? How much more does God demonstrate his love for us when we fail? How much more does he cleanse us, forgive us, strengthen us, comfort us, put us back on the path, dust us off, and say, keep walking? Amen. See, but shame tries to come against the purpose and plan of God and come into on that path and render us ineffective. See, but God's love is the antithesis to shame. And the reason we need that love every day, we need to recognize, we need to walk with it in faith. We need to confess the love of God. We need to believe that God loves us no matter what is going on in our lives. The good, the bad, and the ugly, God loves us. Yeah. Yeah. See, God's love for you is the kryptonite that renders shame powerless. Yes, I said kryptonite in church. <laughs> But God's love for you eradicates the shame in our lives. Amen. Where you may feel I'm not worthy. Where you may feel, uh, I, 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 it's again, I'm coming to you again with this. God does not, because he's not going to shame you, because he doesn't have shame, he, re he removes the shame from our lives. Because shame is of the devil and it has no place in our lives. God asks to come boldly before the, great, the, before the throne of grace to find Grace and mercy and help in a time of need. Yeah. Nowhere in there does he, does he put shame on us. So if God has, does not have shame, shame should have no part in our lives. Number three, shame looks to rob us, but God looks to prosper us. It says here, for, for the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. God forgives us. Amen? Amen. God forgives us. Amen? Amen? God forgives us. Amen? Amen. God forgives us. Amen? Amen? Amen. God, you're forgiven. Amen. Amen. I do a lot of wrong with you. Amen. I got a big mouth. Amen. Not the amen on the big mouth. I'm forgiven. Not that I have a right to say what I say, and believe me. It's a lot of, mm, it is, there is a lot. But sometimes I look, it sneaks out. Sometimes, but it, I'm forgiven, amen. The thoughts, I'm forgiven. So are you, amen. When I say God's forgiven, it is a big amen. We're forgiven. Shame looks to condemn you. God looks to forgive you. God embraces 
leaves you with forgiveness. Shame drives you with condemnation. Mm -hmm. Shame is a curse. Yes, it is. And some of us live a lifestyle of shame because we've been cursed with it from our childhood. And God wants to break the power of shame over your life to give you a, a newness of life, a newness of hope, a newness of freedom that you can stand against shame. Yes, amen. See, God teaches us how to walk our path. Look what he says here. He said, For the sake of your name, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct them in the way chosen for him. You've been given a path, a chosen path. And he instructs you on how to walk that path. And then not only does he instruct you, instruct you, but he also blesses you on it. Now, when I say blessing, I'm not only talking monetarily. Well, that is a blessing. But there are more blessings than money. Favor is a great blessing. Man, you have the favor of God. There's great blessings on your life. Doors open for you that no other man can open. Favor is great to have. The mercy of God, that's a great blessing. Prosperity doesn't only come financially. Prosperity can be even the place that you live. That you're like, what a beautiful place we live. Wow, like, how did this come about? Because the Lord prospers you in the way. As you walk in the way, he prospers you. He gives you things that even you don't have the ability to, to, to create on your own. He gives them to you. He prospers you along the way. Prospers you with children. Prospers you with a job. Prospers you with great with wisdom and, and knowledge and strength of, and strength. He prospers you. See, God wants to prosper us. Shame wants to hinder us. Can't do this one. It's too hard. The task is too great. I mean, look at Moses. I'm not saying that Moses was in shame at the moment, but when God told him to go back to Pharaoh, what, what, what happened to, to Moses? I, I can't. I, 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 I stutter. Shame. I can't do what you called me to do. I'm, I'm, not, I'm inadequate. Shame. When God calls us to do something, the enemy immediately wants to put shame on us because what he wants us to do is look inward and see our inadequacies. God's not looking at your inadequacies. God's calling you to do something that you can't do, but he can do through you. Amen. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We try to get not by might, not by power, but so by my spirit, says the Lord. Got a little high there. A little falsetto voice there, but... When God calls you, he's not calling you to do it because you have some great talent. No. He's calling you to do it because you have no talent. Yeah. You have no strength. So that you would totally rely on him. Yeah. So we look inside, oh, I can't do it. Uh, uh, and shame begins to go, I, I, I'm not the man. You are the man. You are the woman for exactly what God would call you to do. Yeah. And, and you need to not go You need to use shame and be obedient and watch God prosper you and use you and move through you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. You know, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the forum. Me too. This week, remember I was talking about pray for divine appointments, right? Yeah. Walking the path, right? So I was going, I was in Millbrook, I was going into the pharmacy, and there was someone standing under the awning of, uh, of the funeral home with two bags packed. And the person said, hey. And I was like, oh, it's my time. <laughs> <laughs> two bags packed. I wasn't ready. So I went over to him, and it was one of the kids from the middle school. Aww. Yeah, that's so why I was like, oh. I said, Eli, what's going on? I'm going to Florida. What are you doing waiting on the morning on a funeral? <laughs> I guess they moved Hades. <laughs> but he's like, no, I'm going to Florida. And we're all excited. And I was like, oh, you know, and a great, oh, tell me about it when you get back. I want to hear about it. Where are you going? I'm going to Orlando. I said, you're going to Disney World? Yeah. Are you going to um, uh, Universal Studios? Oh, I said, that's much better than Disney World. He goes, well, what, what do you recommend? <laughs> I haven't been there in 20 years. I don't know. You know, the King Kong ride, I guess, you know, and things like that. But um, 
He said, I'll tell you about it when I get back. And then I walked into the pharmacy and God said, what about me? And I'm like, you're right, Lord. So I got my hat again. I walked back out and I said, Eli, I got to let you know something. Man, God loves you. And I love you. I want to let you know you're special to him. Now, isn't that amazing? You know, not, not, uh, amazing. But do you understand? You're on your path. God has something for you to say and something for you to do. Yeah. Shame wants to render you unworthy. And, and shame wants to, God, the devil wants to put shame on you so you feel you can't fulfill the path of, that God has for you in, in any given moment. But no, he, he gives you the grace. He gives you the strength. He gives you the encouragement. He gives you the word. All we have to do is step out and walk our path. But shame wants to rob us of it. In life, there are two places to hide. I'm going to bring this in in just a moment. But David says, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress. And take away all my sins. See how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope is in you. See, there are really only two places in life in which you can hide. See, if you hide in the Lord, there's blessings of hiding in the Lord. And there were six of them that were shown here in Psalm 25. Blessing number one is he's gracious to me when I'm lonely and afflicted. See, sometimes we go through things in life and people can't understand, even those closest to us. But God does. God doesn't sympathize with us in our afflictions and our loneliness. He empathizes. Jesus, even in the midst of his disciples, was lonely. Understand, Jesus was pure. And he was among the midst of those that were sinful. I mean, even his own brothers came and wanted to capture him because they thought he was out of his mind. Jesus understands loneliness because Jesus was lonely at times. He understands what it is to be lonely. He understands your afflictions. And so he's gracious to you when you're lonely and afflicted. Blessing number two, he frees me from my anguish. Blessing number three, he takes away my sins. Blessing number four, he guards my life. Blessing number five, he rescues me. Blessing number six, he restores integrity and uprightness and hope once again. Six blessings of hiding yourself in the Lord. The second place you can hide is in your shame. Hiding in your shame, there's no blessing at all. There's zilch, there's nada, there's none, there's niet, there's zip. There is no blessing in shame. There's only anguish, loneliness, affliction, discouragement, despair. So you get to choose where your hiding place is on a daily basis. Will you hide in the Lord? Or will you hide in your shame? David brings this, this psalm to a beautiful crescendo when he says here, Redeem Israel, O God, from all their troubles. See, what God is, God will always do, he will always redeem you. He will always be with you. He will always comfort you. He will always instruct you. He will always rescue you. He will always take you out of your troubles. God is a faithful God who will seek you through to the end. Shame multiplies our troubles. God redeems us from our troubles. Amen? Amen. 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 
Now, when I said that there was some prophetic things going on, the worship was talking about healing, it even talked about shame, it talked about, there were so many things going, going on in worship that God was preparing our heart. And I don't know what your struggle may be with shame, I know what, what mine is, is, and I know that this word ministered to me greatly, and I hope it ministered to you. But we need to take some time before the Lord today. Healing is yours today. Healing over shame is yours today. Receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a hand clap this morning.